Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our time series analysis looking at a concept called unit roots. Now, unit roots are important because they end up being something that gets in the way of us properly modeling a time series. And the reason for that is if we have a time series with a unit root, then it's not stationary and we cannot apply our typical AR, MA, ARMA models just blindly. We have to do some transformations to uh, remove the unit root from the time series. And even if we can't do any transformations, at least we should be aware that this time series has a unit root so we can maybe try some other methods of analysis on it. So before I get into all the math of what a unit root is, which I promise is not that difficult, especially because we'll be looking at the most basic just AR1 model, although unit roots apply to all of the time series models we've looked at. Um, the, the first thing we're going to do is look at just a few diagrams, and I want to walk us through whether we think each one is stationary or not. Remember, in our discussion of stationarity, we had a couple of criteria. The main ones were that a time series should have constant mean over time, should have constant variance over time, and should have no seasonal component. So let's do a quick visual check to see if these three graphs, which will correspond to three different situations mathematically, to see if any of them look stationary or not. Let's look at this first one. It seems to have somewhat of a constant mean over time. It seems like uh, the variance also is not changing too drastically over time. Doesn't look like there's a big seasonal component, so um, maybe some further analysis is needed, but just visually, maybe we would say that's stationary. Let's take a look at this one. This one is clearly not stationary, right? Because it violates just the main first condition of having a constant mean over time. We see the mean starts rather low and then seems to be going up to infinity. So for that reason alone, we'd probably say that that is not stationary. Now, what about this guy? Um, this guy, a lot of you would be saying, no, it's not stationary because its mean is going up over time. Yeah, that's, that's a good reason to rule it out. Um, what if I had given you less of the series, maybe before it starts going up? Then it becomes a little bit more difficult to tell, right? You would say, maybe there's still an upward trend. The variance seems to be somewhat constant over time, but it's not really easy to tell just visually whether this thing is stationary or not. Um, and this ends up being the case where you do have a unit root. And that's why unit roots can be so nasty, is because if we're just doing a quick visual check on a time series, they end up being the most ambiguous case about whether a time series is stationary or not. So we have to do a lot of extra work to figure out whether or not unit root time series are stationary. So now, given that kind of high-level overview of unit roots, let's dive into the math behind it. Now, as we said, for this video, we'll be using this very simple AR1 model. So it simply says that a time series is modeled as the lagged version of the time series, just one lag prior, which makes this an AR1 model. And of course, we have this epsilon sub t term. This phi is the multiplicative coefficient on the one lagged version of the time series. And this whole video is going to be focused on what different values this phi can take. Because in the past, we haven't really explicitly said anything about what phi can be. Is it higher than one? Is it lower than one? Can it be one? In this video, we'll talk about all three of those cases and what they imply for the stationarity of the time series. Before we do that, let's also go back to our uh, how an AR1 is the same thing as an MA infinity video. So in that video, we showed that if we have a very simple AR1 model, we can also represent it as a MA model. So in this case, it's a combination of the first term in the time series, and then the rest is just lagged versions of this epsilon. So um, go back to that video to convince yourself of that. Another way you can convince yourself of that is just recursively write out this guy as phi a t minus 2 plus epsilon t minus 1 and then just recursively write the time series like that and you'll get the same representation here. But either way, just suffice it to say that an AR1 model can be re represented as a MA model with many lags on the epsilon. So if we represent it this way, let's say we want to care about two quantities, the variance of our time series and the uh, expected value of our time series. Let's actually look at expected value first. So I took expected value of this guy. That's the same thing as taking the expected value of the right-hand side. But the expected value of epsilon is 0 because we assume the errors have 0 mean. So that goes away. So we just end up doing phi times the expected value of a t minus 1. So you see this ends up being recursive because now we can just take out another phi and then go to a t minus 2 and keep going until we get to the first uh, the first value of the time series, which was a0, and then at that point we have phi to the power of t a0. So we find that the expected value of our time series at any timestamp t is simply phi to the power of t times the first value at the time series. That's going to be useful in all three cases. 
the other quantity we care about is the variance of the time series because we want to make sure it's constant over time to ensure stationarity. So we take the variance of AT. Um, we get we use this representation to help us out with that. This is just a constant, right? Because phi is a constant, A0 is a constant, so this doesn't factor into the variance of AT. So the variance all comes from here. The variance of these epsilons are all assumed to be the same, some kind of sigma squared, which doesn't change over time. So we pull out that sigma squared, and then these guys, this phi to the power of k's, are all just constants. So we can just add them up, squaring them each time because we're doing a variance. So we have phi to the 0, phi squared, phi to the 4th, all the way to phi to the 2, t minus 1. So this is our formula for the variance of our time series at any time stamp t. And this is the formula for our expected value of the time series at any time stamp t. Now we've done all the mathematical hard work, all that's left to do is work through the three cases of what phi could be in order to see whether or not the time series is stationary in each case. So case number one, we have absolute value of phi is less than one. So basically phi is between negative one and one, not including either bound. So examples could be phi is negative 0.5 or positive 0.7, things like that. So in this case, what is the expected value of AT? Remember, in all cases, it's this phi to the power of t, a0. Now, if phi is something like 0.5, as we let t go to infinity, so as the time series goes on and on and on, this 0.5 to the power of t goes to 0, right? Because any number whose absolute value is less than 1 raised to the power of progressively higher exponents is going to go to 0. So we get that the expected value of this time series goes to 0 in this case. So, so far, stationarity is satisfied because our expected value is some constant over time. At least it's going to a constant over time. Now the other thing we can do, which is slightly more difficult, but not too difficult to prove, is doing variance of AT goes to the sigma squared over 1 minus phi squared. To see why this might be true, all you have to do is look at this formula. This thing inside, you're going to notice, you might have already noticed as a geometric series, because it's phi to the 0 plus phi squared, phi to the 4th, and then as t goes to infinity, this becomes an infinite geometric series. And we're allowed to sum it up in this case because the common ratio, which is phi squared, is less than 1 in absolute value. Or it's less than 1. Um, and the reason it's less than 1 is because phi is less than 1. So if I took that sum, that infinite sum, I get exactly um, 1 over 1 minus phi squared. So that's why the variance goes to that quantity over time. So these two conditions tell us that the time series is stationary because it has a constant mean over time, zero, and it also ends up having a constant variance if you give enough time. So as you go, as this time series progresses to bigger and bigger and bigger timestamps, the variance converges to uh, sigma squared over one minus phi squared. So in this case, if the absolute value of the coefficient phi is less than one, our time series is good to go, it's stationary. And so we put a check in this case. Let's look at the next case. The next case is the opposite, where we have the absolute value of phi is bigger than 1. Now, before even doing any math, honestly, you can probably tell what's going to happen just by looking at this very first equation. If phi was something bigger than 1, let's say it was like 1.5, then on average, we would basically have the time series exploding up over time, right? Because uh, it would start at some a0, then we would multiply that by 1.5 then in the next iteration we will multiply that result by 1.5. So it's just kind of skyrocketing either in a negative or positive direction over time, which is exactly what we see in this graph. So it's exploding here in a positive direction. It could also just as easily have been exploding in a negative direction. Looking purely mathematically, what's the expected value of the time series? So we get it from this formula. Since phi is something bigger than one in absolute value, when we raise something bigger than one to the power of bigger and bigger exponents, that of course goes to positive or negative infinity. So this basically converges to plus or minus infinity. And for that reason alone, it's not stationary. So we found that if phi is bigger than one in absolute value, our time series is not stationary. So we put x not stationary. Now, here's the main focus of this video which is the unit root case. I want to finally give the definition of what a unit root is. A time series has a unit root. So in this case, this AR1 model has a unit root if phi in absolute value is equal to 1, which ends up being just two choices. Either it's 1 or negative 1. But we did this for an AR1 model. But in general, you can have any number of lags in a time series. And the unit root becomes slightly more difficult to uh, define. It ends up being a function of something called the characteristic equation, which 
we'll do in a future video. But just know that any kind of time series can have a unit root or some unit roots, and they all cause problems in their own ways. So in our case, uh, a time series, our AR1 model will have a unit root if phi is plus or minus 1. Let's see what happens mathematically in that case. Now the expected value of a sub t, again given by this formula, phi is 1 now, so I don't really even think about it. It's simply just a0. Now this result is the crux of why unit roots are so finicky, why they're so tricky to look at visually and see whether or not it's stationary. The first condition actually doesn't violate anything about stationarity because it's saying that the expected value of our time series at any timestamp is simply just the first value of the time series. Uh, another way of saying that is the mean of our time series over time is constant, which is actually a check for the first condition of stationarity. So maybe we're on the right track. Maybe this time series is stationary. Um, but not so fast. Let's look at what happens to the variance over time. Now, if I took this variance formula, and it simplifies nicely, because in my case, phi is all 1, right? So this is just 1 plus 1 plus 1, and we have t of them. So the variance of our time series at any timestamp t is simply given by t sigma squared, which means that as the timestamp gets bigger, as time goes on, the variance of my time series gets bigger and bigger and bigger, basically multiplying by sigma squared each time. So for that reason, my time series is not stationary because it violates the constant variance assumption of stationarity. Because as time goes on, the variance is getting bigger, therefore the variance is not constant. And we kind of see that in this picture, right? Um, in the beginning, the variance is kind of low, but as we get to bigger and bigger values, the variance is kind of getting bigger. And if we did another run of this time series, we might get something like this. So although the expected value of the time series, no matter how far you go in the future, is always the same, like the expected value, whether it went up here or whether it went down here, is always something like that. The variance is un this variance is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which means that it becomes more and more difficult for us to tell where the time series is going to be as time goes on. So for that reason, time series with unit roots are not stationary, but they can look stationary, they can look deceptively stationary, which is why they cause us these issues. Now, uh, the last thing I want to do in this video is do a quick trick on, at least for the AR1 model, if we have this behavior, how do we make it stationary? Doing something very simple. Well, um, we can do the first difference. So if I did, let d sub t is equal to a sub t minus a sub t minus 1. So basically this is just taking each value of the time series and then subtracting the value that came just before it and using those differences to create a new time series called d sub t. Then we have that d sub t. So basically if I took this guy and subtracted this guy, I would just get epsilon sub t left. So that's why d sub t is exactly epsilon sub t, which means the expected value of d sub t is 0, since that's the expected value of our error. And the variance of d sub t is the same as the variance of our error, which is sigma squared. So basically, we have taken a time series which was not stationary, which was a sub t, and we've done this basic first differencing transformation to make it stationary. Constant mean, constant variance over time. So that's one very quick trick you can do. Now, I hope that was a good introduction to unit roots, something really gentle, just using the AR1 model, nothing too complicated. Um, the next set of videos that concern these topics will be thinking about the characteristic equation of a more complicated time series, not just AR1. And then we'll also talk about how to detect unit roots in a more robust way, so using the Dickey-Fuller test, for example. All right, so I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I'll see you next time.